Hi, everyone. I'm here with Emma Rhodes, and we'll just do a couple of announcements, and then I'll introduce her, and we'll get on to her talk. Um, next week, the bird chat is with Andrew Cratter from Gainesville on the crossing of the looms. Very interesting phenomenon. You have to register, sign up to be sent the Zoom link for bird chats, and the link to sign up is on the Orange Audubon Society website. Um, please go to orangeaudubonfl.org to follow our events or our, on our Facebook page. And we will have questions at the end. Please write your questions in the chat. So now I will introduce Emma. Um, we are very excited to have you. Um, uh, you are a hummingbird bander at Auburn, Alabama, and um, you're a student also, a PhD student at university there in Auburn. Um, you started banding when you were 14 years old. Your father brought you down there to the sergeants, um, Martha and Bob Sergeant um, banding station down in Gulfport, is it? Um, Fort Morgan, Alabama. Fort Morgan. Okay. And now 12 years later, you um, are, and you have been for a while, a full-fledged licensed bander, and you have your own program. And for a while, you worked for the university. You were an undergrad at University of Southern Alabama, and you um, were a coastal biologist for Audubon down there. And now you're PhD program is on bird migration, which is a topic that Orange Audubon is very fascinated by. We were just talking also about a Hog Island camp where you uh, intersect with Scott Widensall, our speaker from last month. And he was a, a mentor of yours years ago as well. Oh yeah, yeah, I've known Scott since I started at, um, when I was 14 at the Sergeant's Banding Station because he would come in the spring during the spring migration sessions and that's actually where i originally met him um, and then i intersected with him again at the hog island teen camp when i went for the first year as a teen camper uh, myself and now of course i have been going back um, as an actual instructor very cool um so without further ado i will let you get into your presentation and thank you again for coming. Thank you for having me, Deborah. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, thank you for everyone who is tuning in this evening. Really excited to share my hummingbird research um, with you guys and talk about hummingbirds. I am really biased and I absolutely love hummingbirds, love all birds, but these um, are, are one of my favorite groups of birds. So like Deborah said, my name is Emma Rhodes. Um, I am the uh, Director of Conservation and Scientific Research for Banding Coalition of the Americas. It's a 501c3 um, nonprofit that I co-operate. And so I do uh, many of my side projects um, under um, this umbrella. So just a little bit about the origin of the Hummingbird Research Program in the Southeastern U.S. This was started by Hummingbird Research Incorporated, which is also a nonprofit organization, ran by Fred Bassett. So Fred uh, has been uh, studying hummingbirds for decades, and he is a wonderful mentor of mine and has taught me almost everything I know about hummingbirds. And he started this organization in, in 2009, but he's been doing hummingbird research since um, 1997. And he started this project uh, to promote the conservation of hummingbirds by research and education. He also has uh, several peer reviewed publications that are featured on his website. And um, he's banded more than 3000 hummingbird individuals throughout his lifetime. It's probably uh, much more than that at this point. And he sort of coordinates um, this partnership among us winter hummingbird banders. So we're all volunteers uh, doing this winter hummingbird banding. 
Um, and we're primarily focused on four southeastern uh, United States. And so here in red, you could see the four states that we focus on for this project. So Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. So before I get into research and facts about hummingbirds, I want to talk about hummingbird attraction because I get a lot of questions about this every year. And it's a really important part um, talking about how to properly attract hummingbirds and some best uh, methods for doing that. So a couple recommendations I have in terms of hummingbird feeders, if you're looking into buying some. Um, the top bullet point here has some of my favorite hummingbird feeders. Personally, they're easy to clean. That's a huge bonus in my opinion. Um, and that includes Perky Pet, Coles, and JB Feeders. So they're relatively cheap and they're easy to clean. So simpler is better, in my opinion, when it comes to hummingbird feeders. And for um, sugar water, I get this question all the time. What's the proper ratio of water to sugar? So the uh, ubiquitous recipe that all hummingbird banders and hummingbird experts tell people is to follow the rule of five, and that's four parts water, one part white table sugar. And this mimics natural flower nectar. This is the closest mimic. Now, it is really important to not use things like honey or organic sugar, just regular white table sugar, because again, this is the closest biochemical mimic of regular nectar. A lot of these organic sugars will have added things that could actually be toxic to birds and um, honey can actually grow deadly bacteria. Uh, red dye is not healthy for hummingbirds. It's not healthy for us. And we as hummingbird experts believe that it's a safe assumption to say it's not healthy for them. It goes right through them. I have banded hummingbirds before that um, are essentially are peeing and you could see the red dye just coming out in the pee. And so they don't process it. That's what that tells us. And so red dye is not necessary. You can attract birds just fine without red dye. Cleaning feeders. Uh, keeping your feeders clean are real, is, is a really important thing. Black mold can also be deadly to hummingbirds. So keep your feeders clean and how often is going to depend on your temperature and your climate. If it's in the summer, you're going to have to clean your feeders probably every two to three days. In the winter, sometimes feeders can be kept out for as long as a week or two um, before you need to clean it. So um, planting native plants also does not hurt and uh, will immensely help you in your um, efforts to attract more hummingbirds to your yard. So the best way to get the most hummingbirds in your yard um, is to have a combination of native flowering plants and um, uh, feeders. And this is the best way to get hummingbirds um, in your yard. So now let's talk about the behavior and life history of hummingbirds. So this photo I really love because this is showing a, a sexual display. So it's a, a, a sexual attraction mechanism that the Calliope hummingbird uses to attract mates. It also uses it to ward off other males. Uh, so this male Calliope is showing his gorget feathers to the female saying, hey, look at me, I'm the best mate around. Uh, you know, ha mate with me. And so uh, hummingbirds have all these different displays the males do in order to attract female mates. Hummingbirds are the most diverse uh, group of family of birds in the bird world. And in, in uh, um, aves, uh, Hummingbirds, Trochilidae, are widely diverse. They come in all sorts of different forms and colors, and they fill these unique niches. Some of them very specialized and more, and some birds um, are more ubiquitous in that they can feed on multiple flowers and multiple sources of nectar. 
And some of these birds have co-evolved with plants, with flowering plants, and they depend on those plants and those plants depend on them as uh, pollinators. So the family Trochilidae, that's where, um, that's the family that hummingbirds belong to. Um, they have over 330 species, species of hummingbird, hummingbirds in that family. And, um, and, it, and it's still growing. So there's evidence that hummingbirds are not done evolving and that there may be new species in the upcoming decades. So I think that is really cool when you think about it. So hummingbirds show extreme size diversity. So here on the left, this is the bee hummingbird. It's endemic to Cuba, and it is just over two inches in length. And I really like this picture for comparison because this is showing you the smallest hummingbird on the left and the largest hummingbird on the right. This is the giant hummingbird, which is the size of a uh, medium-sized passerine bird, maybe a warbler. Like I was saying earlier, these birds have co-evolved, certain hummingbirds have co-evolved to um, fill in these tight niches. And you can see here on the left, this is a, a hermit, um, a hermit hummingbird, and their bill has evolved this curved hook in order to reach the nectar at the bottom of some flowers. And on the right, this is the sword-billed hummingbird. It has the longest bill to body ratio of any bird overall. And that bill is so it can reach the nectar in um, these trumpet uh, plants, these tubular uh, flowers found in South, Central and South America. Excuse me, just South America. Now, hummingbirds live on the extreme. And this is one of the reasons why they're so aggressive. They're so food aggressive is you may think hummingbirds are very sweet, but they're very aggressive as you may have observed um, during your observation of birds um, not sharing your feeders that you offer them. And one of the reasons they're so food aggressive is because they, they have to have uh, a lot of food every day to survive. They have to eat over half their weight in food every day. Um, they do, they don't just eat, uh, they don't just consume nectar. They also eat insects. That's a really important part of their diet, especially during the breeding and potentially during the wintering seasons. So how do these birds survive cold nights? You know, you, you see some of these birds on the northerly part of their ranges and it can get to uh, freezing and below freezing and be really uh, cold temperatures. And how do they survive this when they have such high metabolisms? Well, they do something called torpor. So on the right, this is a, a picture of a bird that has uh, not waken up from torpor yet. And so a lot of times uh, people will find these birds like this and, and think that the bird actually is deceased but what it is, is that bird is unable to immediately come out of this partial hiber hibernating state. So torpor is when they essentially slow their heart rate, they uh, lower their body temp. And so that way they don't have to expend all this energy at night. And so they can make it through cold nights. Now, as the sun comes up and as um, their internal clock knows that, hey, it's, it's time to get up and feed, they start uh, moving around and they start to slowly come out of that torpor. So hummingbirds are really cool in that they're the only bird that can truly fly backwards. They're unable to walk, they can perch, but they're not able to walk, but they're really cool in terms of their dexterity of, of flight motion. They can hover, they can fly backwards, and they're really masters of flight in my opinion. So let's get into the breeding biology of hummingbirds. So this is a hummingbird nest. As you can see for a size comparison, it is the size of a quarter roughly. And this on the left is a ruby-throated hummingbird female on her nest that she made. 
So I'm going to just talk about the breeding biology specifically relating to ruby-throated hummingbirds because that's our only breeder that we have east of the Mississippi River. Uh, so it's the only one that we see here, uh, well, you'll see here in Florida uh, breeding. And so um, with hummingbirds and with the ruby-throated hummingbird, the male does not assist in any way with the building of the nest or the rearing of the young. So the female is the sole provider for young. Now, they like to nest anywhere between 7 to 70 feet um, in the air, and they're going to pick a downward sloping branch to, to uh, they're going to select a downward sloping branch to build their nest. So this is a little bit of a game of I spy. Uh, how this person found this nest, you can see it in the center of the screen here. This is a female on her nest. It is a, uh, it is for sure camouflaged, right? I think we can all agree on that, that uh, they are very difficult to find given their size. And it is very camouflaged because of the lichen that the female puts on the outer part of the nest. And so this is to uh, evade predators. So yeah, the female constructs the nest using various plant materials, spider webs to put it all together, and then puts lichen on the outer parts of the nest. She'll lay one to two tic tac sized eggs. And here's what the eggs look like in that nest cup. She'll incubate for 15 days before hatching begins. Once they're, uh, the babies hatch, they're completely naked and helpless. And it takes around 23 days for them to leave the nest. So here is a series of photos um, uh, these two uh, baby hummingbirds maturing, starting to get their bristle and down feathers in. Before ruby-throated hummingbird fledgers leave the nest, they essentially outgrow the nest. They are bigger than the parent. And once they reach this age where they're about to fledge, the female if she has enough time, has already started a second nest and a second brood within a nearby location. All right, so now let's talk about migration and wintering habits. So here's a range map for the ruby-throated hummingbird. This is a map I just grabbed from allaboutbirds.org. So in Florida, the spring arrival for ruby-throated hummingbirds can be as early as March, and the peak along the northern Gulf Coast is in April. So this is occurring because ruby-throated hummingbirds, most of them overwinter in Central America. And so in the springtime, they're going to cross the Gulf of Mexico or go a circumgulf uh, way back to, uh, to return to North America to breed. In the fall, the same thing happens, but in reverse. And we see along the Northern Gulf Coast, uh, we start to see these migratory populations in September, and there's a peak in October. Now in Florida, if you zoom in on South Florida, you can see that part of their range um, in South Florida says non-breeding. So in other words, there is a population that has long been understood to not migrate and just winter in South Florida. So why do we study wintering hummingbirds and, and what is a wintering hummingbird? So when we're talking about winter hummingbirds, we're talking about this occurrence of these primarily Western hummingbird species that instead of moving south for the winter, which has been long understood that many of these birds that um, nest and breed in the Western US will go down to Mexico and South America for the winter. But it's this occurrence of these birds, instead of moving south, moving east. And this is the occurrence that we're trying to understand better and trying to get an idea of 
what's happening? Are more showing up each winter? And what's driving this? And what species do we see um, occurring consistently in the Eastern US? So I put this up here. This is from um, Hummingbird Research's um, uh, website. And it shows by calendar year, by month, when we see the, the most occurrence of winter hummingbirds. And you can see that actually December and January are when we get the most reports for uh, winter hummingbirds overall. So we know that these winter hummingbirds are not the same as these migratory ruby-throated that you're seeing in peak migration in, in March and April and September and October. This, these are completely different population of birds. So what are some of the documented species that we've seen in the southeastern U.S.? So I'm going to go over, this is not a completely full list, comprehensive list, but this is some of the more prominent ones that we'll see and that we've documented in the eastern U.S. that I wanted to, to introduce to you so you can be aware of the diversity of birds that we've actually seen throughout the decades in the eastern U.S. So first is the ruby-throated hummingbird. We've gone over that this is our breeder, but some of them, other than that very southernly uh, Florida population, some of the, these individuals will winter along the northern Gulf Coast. In fact, it's our second most uh, prominent wintering species along the northern Gulf Coast. So there's still quite a bit that we don't understand about the species. Um, including how specifically the migrating populations, what routes they take, and as well as characterizing what these populations are doing that are staying uh, or that are coming to the east to overwinter. Where are they coming from? Are they from more northerly populations? Our banding evidence, our, our banding data shows evidence for that, that the ones that winter um, in the, along the northern Gulf Coast are coming from the more northerly parts of their breeding regions. Black chin hummingbird, this is a species that is very common out in Texas and along the um, uh, west coast. And the black chin hummingbird is our third mo most prominent species that we ban in the winter. And um, it has this really cool purple gorget the males do. And actually, just an interesting story, I recaptured two winters ago, I recaptured a bird um, that was at least seven years old, a black chin hummingbird female. Uh, it was banded seven years prior by my mentor at the same house. So they have really high sight fidelity. Rufus hummingbird, this is our the number one wintering hummingbird species that you may see. It also has some of the longest migrations of any hummingbird, over 3,000 miles if it breeds in Alaska and winters in Mexico. Allen's hummingbird. So Allen's hummingbird belongs to the same genus as Rufus, and it is very hard to tell these two apart just using observation. It has to do with very minute differences within the tail. So a lot of times we won't know if you have an Allen's in, unless you have really up close photos of the tail or it's just an obvious adult male. We won't know until we actually capture the bird. broad -tail hummingbird. This is a breeder in the Saharas um, and the Rockies. They actually sound like a little insect buzzing around. Um, and that's due to their wing structure. It makes that noise. Um, but they have this really gorgeous, the males have this really gorgeous pink gorget. And um, this is a bird that we see in the winter months along the, the Gulf Coast. In fact, I, I banded two in Mississippi, in southern Mississippi last year. Calliope hummingbird. So Calliope hummingbird is actually the smallest of all North American uh, hummingbird species. And um, they're really cool. 
And we do see a few um, sometimes in the winter. They're one of the more rarer ones, uh, but we will see a few. And this is a, a Western uh, U.S. breeder. Buff-bellied hummingbird. So buff-bellied hummingbird, uh, we will get a few of these. I actually banded one last fall that has returned for its second year uh, near where I originally uh, banded it. And buff-bellied hummingbird, um, some breed in the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, nor they actually do not breed in the U.S. at all. And they, but they are found along the Southeast, like I mentioned sometimes, but they typically breed in Central and South America. Now, broad-billed hummingbirds, some of them do breed in the Southwest, um, but they primarily breed in Mexico and South America. But we do see some of these individuals pop up um, in the winter seasons as well. Anna's hummingbird, Anna's hummingbird is found along the Pacific coast. There's a population that migrates and a population that is resident. Um, and we will see some of these birds, uh, individuals as well, the species um, here in the winter. And interestingly, this is uh, one of the few hummingbird species that actually sings. Uh, you may not have realized this, but a lot of hummingbirds don't actually have a, a bird song. They just make little chirp noises and, and variable uh buzz noises. White-eared hummingbird. Um, we actually, um, Fred Bassett banded the first record of this bird back in 2015 in Mobile, Alabama. So it's the first record in Alabama for that bird. I know of one other record in Biloxi, Mississippi, that was, I believe, over a decade ago when it was banded. Uh, so this is a, one of the more uncommon ones because it breeds um, in Central America. It's not a, a typical, it's not a breeder in the US. So we typically don't see this bird. Costa's hummingbird. This is also um, a Pacific Coast breeder. Um, for the Hummingbird Research Project, we have two birds that we've banded um, in our records. This was before I was involved in the project, so I'm not sure of the details of that. So again, this is one of the more rarer birds, but it has showed up. Rivoli's hummingbird, we have banded a few of these in the eastern U.S. Um, they do pop up along um, the southern Texas, um, but you're typically not going to see this bird um, unless you go to Central America. But some of these birds have also showed up. And to summarize, we're going to go over the, the two most rare ones that we've recorded. This is the green-breasted mango. What the heck it was doing in North America, I don't know. But I only know of two records of them that ever recorded in North America. The first one was a bander in North Carolina, and then the second one was actually um, banded by my original mentor, Bob Sargent, in Dublin, Georgia. Then to finish off on talking about the species that you, you have been recorded, Mexican violet ear. Uh, there have been a total of six records recorded in um, North America. And one of those was actually banded last summer in Tennessee by a Cindy Rutledge. Um, it's a hummingbird banner I know out of Tennessee. And, and what it was doing, no idea. These are more of the, what we would call vagrant hummingbirds. So instead of this consistent movement east, these are birds that may have lost their way or just wandered too far. We're not really sure, but this is why we do this research is to record these occurrences. All right, so let's get into common myths and misconceptions. I make a point to go over this when I talk about hummingbirds because there are a lot of long-standing myths and misconceptions about bird, hummingbirds that I, I hear um, still today. And so these are the most common ones that I um, will go over and debunk. So the first one is hummingbirds only drink nectar. Like I mentioned to you earlier, hummingbirds also need insects. 
And uh, we think that insects might be a really important food resource when other resources are lacking. Hummingbirds sip nectar like a straw. So hummingbirds actually um, lap up nectar through capillary action. Um, it's not like their, their tongue has a hole in it and they're just sipping up um, the nectar. Hummingbird nectar needs to be red. Went over this before. Please no red dye. It's not needed. Hummingbirds will come regardless of the color of the sugar water. If I lean my feeder up, hummingbirds won't migrate. So this is one of the reasons I showed you that pie chart of when most winter hummingbirds appear. So if hummingbirds were staying because of feeders, hummingbirds would never migrate. Um, they're just opportunistically using your feeders. They're already in the area and there's a lot more things going on that's under genetic control in terms of whether or not they migrate and when and where they migrate to. Hummingbirds don't have feet. I have gotten this question before, whether or not hummingbirds have feet. Yes, they have feet. If hummingbirds stop flying, they will die. And again, these are actual ones that I have come across. So by no means uh, making fun of it if you have uh, had these questions yourself. But this is why I make a point to go over it. And the most... Uh, the common one I have heard um, and has been very, very long standing in the community is this, that hummingbirds migrate on the back of geese. So I am here to tell you that they do not migrate on the backs of geese. They are amazing in what they're capable of. I, I personally think that this probably came about, this myth did, because it's so hard to imagine a bird that weighs five grams uh, so a bird that weighs less than five grams, less than a nickel, is able to migrate for a thousand miles plus and even migrate over 24 hours nonstop. Um, but they have an amazing biology that allows them to do this. And, and no, they're able to do this on their own without the assistance of a goose. Um, just throwing this in here, a lot of times um, I'll come across these or hear someone say they saw a baby hummingbird. Um, so like I mentioned to you before, now you know hummingbirds are full grown uh, before they leave the nest and are in fact a little, are a little bigger than the parents. So there's no such thing as seeing a baby hummingbird out of flower. Uh, you might see a juvenile um, but if you hear of someone saying that they saw a baby hummingbird, uh, be cognizant that it could be this thing called a hummingbird moth that mimics the way that hummingbirds feed on flowers. All right, so now I'm going to go through a series of photos showing you the banding process. So hummingbird banding is a regulated federal process. So we are federally permitted to um, do hummingbird banding, and you have to go through extensive uh, training before you you get permitted. Um, and that's because, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing good science and that is justified why we're handling these birds. And because of how small they are, it takes more training than, uh, for instance, passerines and songbirds. So let's say in the winter, you call me up and you say you have a hummingbird at your house. So what happens? So First I ask, you know, if for your address and if I can come and try to ban it. So at some point I schedule a time with you to try to come and ban the bird. So I would show up and this series is actually a Fred Bassett, my mentor um, at a house banding. So I'd show up, get my equipment. This is the trap here on the ground. This is what it looks like. And I set the trap up almost exactly where the feeder originally was. So I wanna get it as close as possible so the bird is comfortable. I put the feeder in and, oh, sorry about that. And I just wait. So the uh, there's a door that slides up and down and it's just controlled with some fishing line. And so the bird goes in, close it, we take the bird out and we band it. Sometimes we offer the bird sugar water. And this just gives you an idea that, you know, they're not too stressed out that we can't band them because they'll actually feed right out of our hands. So this is what the bands look like. So the bands weigh 1% or less of the bird's 
total body weight. So if you can imagine these birds weigh three to four grams, so again, less than a nickel, these bands have to be very small. So here's what these uh, bands look like. They have one letter and five digits, and it's like a social security number for that bird. So no other bird in that bird's lifetime will have that same unique number of digits. And um, we actually, as hummingbird banders, have to make these bands. So we're, they're already printed for us, the numbers are, and then we have to shear the aluminum strips and form the hummingbird bands. So here's what a band looks like up close. So with our specialized tools, um, we prepare the band, we open it up, put it in our banding pliers, and it goes on the bird's leg. And then we take a series of standard measurements. Wing, tail, all this data is going to be reported to the bird banding lab. That's who issues us the permits and that is the central clearing house for all the bird banding data. So that way, in this way, we can connect the dots of birds' lives and if ever anyone else catches this bird, they'll report it and I'll get that report. So we weigh the bird, with the, we put it in pantyhose so it stays calm and weigh it. Then we'll take some photos if we're able to just for documentation purposes. You can get a photo of, uh, of um, the bird by you just for your record. <laughs> and then um, if you have multiple birds, we might add this little temporary pink dot on the bird's head. So this is a uh, uh, essentially acrylic based paint. So it washes away after a few weeks. It doesn't harm the bird in any way. But we have these yards where we have may have, you know, a handful of birds. And it's hard for us to know, like we don't want to retract the same bird within the same season. So we'll add this little paint so you'll know whether or not it's the same bird as well as when we're trying to trap in your yard. So um, I just wanted to summarize this by uh, mentioning how important our Hummer hosts are and the outreach aspect of this. So we always make a point to explain why we're doing this and trying to connect um, with our Hummer hosts so that they understand <clears throat> the importance of bird conservation and why we're studying hummingbirds. So outreach and education is a really crucial part of the banding process, um, other than the actual research. So what have we found throughout the years? So between 1998 and, and uh, uh, 2020, um, we can see that numbers fluctuate from year to year. So we're still trying to understand what patterns we're observing. Uh, Fred Bassett has a really cool hummingbird paper uh, that was published several years back in the journal of field ornithology that you can read on his website. And I'll give you that website link at the end of this presentation. Um, but what's interesting is over the years, we're going to be able to see what patterns exist, whether or not they are increasing in, in their wintering populations or decreasing, as well as um, the demographics. So this is a, a pie chart breaking down the highest percentage of these demographics we see. And so we can see that adult females and young males are the most prominent um, age and sex demographics that we ban in the southeastern U.S. And this could have important um, meaning in terms of understanding population dynamics of these birds. So before I end tonight, I want to give you some cool examples of um, why banding is crucial and how it connects the dots of birds' lives. So in September of 2019, I got a report that someone uh, could see a male ruby-throated hummingbird at their feeder in near Gulf Shores, Alabama that had a band on its left leg. So I always ban on the right leg. So I knew that this bird was not mine. So after a long attempt of trying to catch this bird, meanwhile, there were 80 plus hummingbirds trying to get to the feeder. It was definitely a feat trying to get this one and only bird. I caught the bird, reported it, and found out that it was banded earlier that season on its breeding grounds 
in Chesterville, um, Massachusetts. And so um, really cool to, uh, to figure out where these uh, birds are going. So another report that I recently got was um, this Rufus hummingbird as a, a, a juvenile I banded last December in Sims, Alabama. And uh, somebody with a lot of patience and a really good camera was able to get the sequence of band numbers, zoom in on it and report the band. And the bird was found in Texas uh, this past summer. But the current record keeper, to my knowledge, is this female Rufus Hummingbird. So this female Rufus Hummingbird was banded in 2010 by Fred Dietrich in Tallahassee, Florida. So he's one of the banders, part of our collaborative group. And in uh, the summer, I believe it was in June 2010, he got a report. And this is where the bird was found. So if you could follow this white line, this is where... Um, Fred Dietrich banded the bird, and it was found in Chenega Bay, Alaska, roughly 3,500 miles north, uh, northwest. And it's actually, to my knowledge, still the current record keeper for on the books of the longest migration on the books of an individual hummingbird. So really cool stuff. And, and this is why um, we, we do what we do. So how can you help? So you can help us by supporting our work. We're all volunteers. Um, Banding Coalition is all volunteer ran. So this is something we do because we're dedicated and passionate about our work. Um, you can also be a Hummer host. So you can maintain a feeder in the winter and give us a call if you see a hummingbird between November 15th and March 1st. Um, also here is the website. That's a really great re uh, resource for um, learning about hummingbirds and is the main website for, um, for this project and that's hummingbirdresearch.org. So thank you again for joining. Um, I hope you have uh, learned some um, hummingbird knowledge and have taken away some new things tonight about our feathered friends um, and please follow us on Facebook. We're on Instagram. You could check out our website and here's my email. If you ever want to contact me or want to discuss something again, thanks so much. And um, now we will take questions. Thank you so much, Emma. That was very interesting. Um, I have a question. Is there any hypothesis as to why, we just have one species of hummer regularly in the United, Eastern United States? Um, that is an excellent question. I don't know right off the top of my head. You know, you see this difference in the number of breeding hummingbirds out west versus east. So there's many more species that breed out west. I am not really sure. I think it has to do with habitat and food availability. That's the first thing off uh, the top of my head that I, I can think of as to why hummingbirds never really diversified in the eastern U.S. Um, but, yeah, that would be something that I would have to um, look into in, in terms of why why so many more species um, evolve in the western United States versus the eastern United States. And I'm not seeing any other questions, so I'll keep trying to come up with some. Um, what, what was the rarest one that you have found in Alabama? Um, so I haven't had any crazy, crazy records as of yet, but I've only been doing this, uh, the Hummingbird Winter Hummingbird Project, for a few years. I would say the rarest I have personally banded would be either the buff-bellied hummingbird that I banded last year in Foley, Alabama, or the uh, the calliope I banded, and I've banded a couple calliopes. Um, but Fred Bassett definitely has the um, the record on that in, in that he's banded a lot of these really rare ones, like the white-eared hummingbird in Mobile, Alabama in 2015. Um, and uh, I think he's banded a Rivoli's hummingbird 
I'm not really sure when that was or where, but yeah, he's, he's definitely banded some of the more rare ones. And that's just because, you know, those could be a once in a decade kind of bird, you know, that, that takes many years for, for those birds to show up. And then Susan asks, I saw a hummingbird in Ohio and Allen's that <clears throat> I was told had a DNA test to confirm Allen's versus Rufus. Did they use a feather? Um, so I, so yeah, you can get extract DNA from a feather and blood. So a feather is obviously the better way to extract DNA. Mm -hmm. And yes, so I don't know. I, I actually am very aware of the bird you're talking about because I'm, I'm a part of, um, a listserv of all of us hummingbird banders throughout the um, the North America, and I saw that that record, but I am not aware of what specifically they use, and I didn't even know they they did a DNA test to to show it. So I um, yeah, feather is one way you can extract DNA, but I'm not sure what uh, the specific case is in this individual bird. And Carly asks, should we report a hummingbird that regularly visits, but we don't keep a feeder? So we have to have a the bird coming to a feeder in order to trap it. So that's an excellent question. But yeah, we have to have a feeder. So you would, you could, you know, if you saw a bird coming to your native flowers, you could put a feeder out then. But in order for us to ban it, we need it to come to a feeder. Now, if you think it's something rare, feel free to always reach out because yeah, we would definitely at least want that report. Um, but in order to ban it, we need it coming to a feeder so we can use our trap mechanism um, to catch the bird. Okay. And Seth Smith says, I live on the North Shore of Lake Okeechobee. When should I have feeders out? So um, I would, so this is what I tell people is have during peak migration time, you can have several feeders going if you if you want. And in terms of food aggression, you're never going to be able to prevent hummingbirds from being aggressive to one another. But actually, the more hummingbird feeders you have closer together, it's better than having them sparsely uh, separated. Because then what's going to happen is that you can have one individual per feeder that's just guarding it. And so uh, you want to kind of crowd hummingbird feeders together. And then what I tell people is during the winter months, just, you know, at least maintain one. Really, it's not really needed to maintain more than one in the winter. I would just keep one going. And if you want to, that way, if there's a winter hummingbird in your area, you'll attract it to your feeder. So is it too late right now, February, mid-February? No, it's never too late. Never too late to start because, yeah, you could have a bird that uh, maybe it's not using a feeder. You know, they don't they're not relying solely on these feeders. They're they are finding natural sources of food, insects, flowers, if they're not all frozen. And so, yeah, it's not too late to go ahead and put one out and just see if one shows up. OK, Delcy says, so they do not return to the same place each year for breeding. Um, so um, they do. So most of the, okay, so most of these birds, so there's something that occurs that we call natal dispersal. So that's when birds first leave the nest, they're going to disperse away from that nesting area. Hummingbirds, this is very common. Why? Because hummingbirds, like we were talking about, are aggressive. Once the birds are independent, the female hummingbird's like, all right, you're on your own. Like, you, you know, you're on your own. You need to do your own thing. They don't follow their parent during migration. So there's this natal dispersal that's occurring and they may or may not return to that location to breed. But once they have um, their first breeding season, if they survive to their first breeding season, they do have, they, they most of them will keep returning if they're successful in that spot. And we also see this on the other end of their cycle. So in the winter, on their wintering grounds, they also have high site fidelity. It might not be the same exact house, 
But a lot of these birds will keep returning if they find, you know, if they are successful in finding food resources around that area. And they, they can have a really long, um, a really large winter range. So they're not going to necessarily stick to one spot, but we see them returning um, every year around the, the same areas. And Delcy also asks, what kind of insects do they prefer? They like things like spiders, gnats, any sort of like probably aphids, so little tiny insects. Um, in fact, it's, I have a funny story. I was banding last winter or trying to catch this hummingbird in this yard in coastal Mississippi. And I saw this hummingbird go up to a suet feeder and poke it. And it looked like the hummingbird was eating suet. And I called my mentor and I was like, this is the most bizarre thing in the world. I swear I just saw this hummingbird go and eat suet, but I know that's not possible. And I know that doesn't make sense. Well, it turns out that this has been seen before. And what it is, is the consensus is that there's little insects, like maybe ants or spider or gnats on the suet and they're picking it off of the suet. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else, any questions? It's very thorough. So, so again, what territory do you band in? And if, if we find someone in our uh, a Hummer at, at our home in Florida, who will come? Okay, so you can contact any of us. And if we don't cover your region, we will get you in contact with someone that does. So um, we cover, me and my team, so me and our other director, Kyle and Fred Bassett, we're covering Alabama, Southern Mississippi, um, parts of Florida, and the Atlanta, Georgia region. So again, that's a lot to remember. So if in doubt, just reach out to us. And if you have a winter hummingbird, you know, we're even uh, people that are not part of the specific Hummingbird Research Incorporated group, we are, are all very collaborative in that we share information and we let others know, other banders know, and we'll get you in contact with the right person in your area, no matter what state you're in, regardless. And Susan asks, are you seeing an increase in rufous hummingbirds in the east during winters? So this is where it gets tricky because, so we didn't start really paying attention to their occurrence um, until the late 90s. So a part of this is, is saying, okay, is it because there are more because of climate change or is it because there are more banders and there's more awareness, more feeders out? And so this is something we're currently working on because now at this point we have gathered, accrued several, you know, a couple of decades worth of data. So this is something I'm interested in is parsing out, okay, are they really increasing? So I can't give an, uh, an answer right now, but that's something we're trying to figure out is, okay, are they actually increasing or is this just a normal thing that just was understudied and they've been here forever, you know, not forever, but they've been here before us essentially. So can you say anything about the, um, breeding biology, how they mate and all that and pair up? So typically what happens in the breeding season is a male will cover a, a territory. So he will have this range depending on, it just depends on the species, um, how big it is. And so that male is gonna try to breed with every female he can find that's within his species in that range. And that's all though. There's no actual like, you know, help in terms of building the, the female building the nest. In fact, the male is still aggressive towards that female, still food aggressive. Um, and so what happens is the male ends up putting most of his effort on trying to mate with all the females he can and defending his territory against other male hummingbirds. And um, like uh, in that case of the calliope, a lot of times they will woo the female through displays. 
that could be a plumage display, like maybe a flash, like so they, you know, they'll try to turn their their gorget because you know their gorget is like a prism, it's um, iridescent, and so at certain points it's going to be brighter, and so they want to flash that patch so that female can look at it, and it's an idea of how good of a quality male of a mate that is. Um, some hummingbirds do this crazy U shape display. Some males will go up and do this use shape um, dance, if you want to call it, display for the females. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so they have different strategies, but that's typically how that's, that's going to um, go down. Very interesting. All right. Well, no one has any questions. I'll probably think of them later. Do you want, can we give an email address perhaps? Yeah, so um, my email address that you can reach me at is Emma, E-M-M-A, uh -huh. at bandingcoalition.org. Coalition.org. Oh, um, and Kathy just had a question. Here, here's yeah. the email. I'll put it up again. Kathy says, can you talk about the importance of native plants for hummingbirds? Yeah, um, they're very important. So, um, uh, it, so hummingbirds have filled these niches that are important for plants and for native plants. And so they're um, an important pollinator, but it's also important for the hummingbirds to have those native resources because um, so, so some non-native plants hummingbirds can get nectar from. But overall, in terms of the health of the ecosystem, you don't want hummingbirds, you know, just uh, having these non-native plants because in turn uh, we're just going to have more non-natives and then that's going to decrease insect populations and in that way that could affect hummingbirds right so like they may not have as as many resources in terms of insect availability um, and so yeah it is important I mean for birds in general native plants and the whole ecosystem is going to suffer if you don't have native plants and yeah that could hurt nesting success of hummingbirds. Um, so there's a, there's a, several ways that could have different ecosystem effects. I'm just writing a couple natives that are excellent. Um, coral bean, it, it blooms exactly in March when they come back. It's got the long tubular flower that's perfectly adapted. And then tropical sage is one that's popular. It Some of the People who have the most hummingbirds do grow a lot of non-native red flowers. Uh, so there's not that many. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it, this is going into that debate of non-native and native. And mm -hmm. so my answer is, though, that obviously native is always better mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. It is better. Uh, Salvia is one. If you go to hummingbirdresearch.net, that website I shared, mm -hmm. they have an excellent list you could download of native plants. So that's a great resource, um, hummingbird friendly plants. Um, so again, hummingbirdresearch.net. Yes, thanks for sharing that, Deborah. All right. Well, people have been saying excellent program and we really do appreciate it. Thanks and, for having me. All right. Well, we'll let you go. Thank you so much. And good night, everybody. Thank you for coming.